very much uh, and thanks for uh, a lot of people in Minas for facilitating my return because we went over some uh, difficult circumstances that has to do with bureaucracy. Uh, special thanks to Ben, uh, Scott, Samira and Sonia. So they did a great job and also Mariam and also the International uh, Faculty and the Scholars Office. Yeah. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, integrating the genre-based approach into teaching Greek in Arabic as a foreign language. And it is very interesting uh, to see the evolution of how this article started uh, in 2013 as just an activity in a classroom here at the University of Arizona. Uh, it was a genre uh, class taught by John Reinhardt in English Language and Linguistics, now English Applied Linguistics. And then it developed or evolved into a component in my comprehensive exam and then finally a research paper. So it's just how uh, it works. In my presentation today, I'm going to talk briefly about the genre-based approach uh, in foreign language teaching or in applied linguistics in general. I'm going to talk about the definition of a genre and how it started in literary studies and then moved to applied linguistics. I'm going to talk about the genre-based approach uh, in ESL or, AFL or EFL, English as a second language or English as a foreign language. Because it is very clear when we read the literature that this approach has been widely adopted uh, in English as a second language. And then, now other foreign language frameworks are making the use of that framework for teaching different types of genres. Then I'm going to shift into the second component of my talk, which is genres in Arabic pedagogy. Uh, why Arabic pedagogy? As we will see, because uh, when I went over the literature into teaching writing in Arabic, not so many has been done, as we will see. The second is when we look at, um, at at least two main textbooks that are adopted for teaching Arabic as a foreign language, the genre-based approach is there, but not as a mechanism or as a tool for teaching writing. It's mainly for reading comprehension. Uh, I'm going to talk about two main texts. These are letters. I'm going back and forth to refer to these during my presentation. Uh, one of them is a personal congratulation letter sent by a friend to his colleague. And another is an official one, an impersonal one, uh, written by uh, a journalist to another journalist in Saudi Arabia. I'm going to refer to these a lot during my talk. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the proposed framework that I have in mind for teaching these two texts again uh, using the genre-based approach. I'm going to talk about the lesson plan that I developed, a very basic and simple one, but I think it may be effective. And then I'm going to conclude with four guiding principles for integrating the genre-based approach in Arabic. Uh, originally, the concept of genre uh, evolved or originated in literature. Uh, it originated in um, um, music also, and also fell. And it used to refer to certain uh, stylistic features in literature, or certain entertainment features in film and music. But then over the past 50 years, this approach, or this term, made its way into other fields. One of them is applied linguistics. We have different types of genres. We have written genres and we have spoken genres. We have written genres like book reviews, film reviews, we have letters, we have music, etc. We have many of these written ones. But at the same time, there is a debate now if spoken conversations and dialogues, like service encounters, are these also considered as genres by themselves or not? For John Swales, uh, who is like a big name in, in genre studies, he thinks these are not. For other people, these are still certain types of genres because they have their own independent structures. When writers or when those who develop them um, make them follow a certain sequence to achieve the communicative purpose in mind. These might include uh, service encounters, conference presentations, teacher-student interactions, and also uh, doctor-patient consultations. Uh, I am going to present here three, uh, only three definitions of uh, genres or a genre, and then I'm going to see the basic highlights of these three definitions. The first is by John Swales, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Uh, he has taken a specific route in the development of the genre-based approach into teaching English as a foreign language, specifically academic English. 
And for Swales, he defines uh, genres as the a genre comprises a class of communicative events, the members of which share some set of communicative purposes. These purposes are recognized by the expert members of the parent discourse community and thereby can institute the rationale for the genre. This rationale shapes the schematic structure of the discourse influences and constrains the choice of content and style. These uh, components that are in red are basically um, uh, the, uh, the important points in his definition. Uh, the first is we have a set of communicative purposes that any writer has in mind uh, he or she wants to achieve. The second is the concept of the discourse community who develops these conventions over time for these different types of genres. And the third is the constrained choices of content and the style that has to do basically with the lexical and grammatical items or the structures that we have in each of these. The second is a definition by Charles uh, Bazerman, University of California at Santa Barbara. He defines such genres as not as forms, but genres are forms of life, ways of being. They are the frames for social action. And for him, they are the frames for social actions because we use them to achieve some functions. We have some functions in mind that we need um, uh, to accomplish. The third is by James Martin, and James Martin, uh, Australia. He comes from uh, a different school uh, of thought in relation to genres. Uh, he's an SESP, um, ESP specialist, and he defines genres as uh, they are ways of how things get done when language is used to accomplish them. Three things here are important in these three different definitions. The first is the communicative purpose or purposes, even if it's very hard to come up with a procedural definition of what a communicative purpose is. Let's see if a student in our class did his best to communicate his message and order a meal at the restaurant. Does it mean that he already met the communicative purpose? For some people, yes. For other people, communicative purposes might be broader than this. The second is the linguistic and the stylistic features. And by, by Linguistic and stylistic features, we mean the choice of the lexical items, the choice of the structures, and also the rhetorical moves. I'm going to touch uh, on these, these three ones. And then the speech community. The speech community, or the community of practice, those are the people who develop these conventions for these different types of genres. Uh, we know that the genres vary in complexity and frequency. Some of them are simple, like for example a letter written to a friend. Some of them are very complex, like a research paper. Some of them are very common, like a receipt that we receive from Walmart when we buy something. That's still a genre by itself, because it has a specific components. But some of them are rare, like a speech by the president after he was selected. Uh, there is uh, some kind of debate about the difference between what a genre is and what a text type is. Uh, for Swale, he gives an interesting example. Let's see if you, made it, uh, if you made it to campus. You see the lectures, you see the classes, you see the labs, and you see the library, and then you ask, but where is the university? For him, there is here a confusion about the underlying function or the underlying purpose of all these things, which is the genre, and the manifestations of that genre in these different text types. So a genre is an underlying concept, maybe an abstract one, that has different instantiations in different text types. Genres also evolve over time, and they evolve um, uh, sometimes for intrinsic uh, factors or considerations, uh, like for example, uh, a group of people at some point, they agree on certain conventions, but at some point they change these. But also because of some extrinsic uh, the considerations, like what we know now in academia, when you write uh, a research article, you have different limitations about the word account, you have to include only and only 200 words, you have to include only uh, five or seven keywords, and then you have to add the highlights. For as well, these extrinsic um, considerations, they restructure these different types of genres over time for external factors. Um, some of the very common uh, structures in genres, uh, some of them might be general to specific, like when we write an introduction in a research paper. We just start very broad and then we get into the details. But it could be the opposite, it could be specific to general. Basically, when we finish everything in the article and we get into the, into the discussion, we start from the small components into the bigger picture. 
Some of them may be uh, chronological, like um, types of genres that present procedures or steps for getting something done. Some of them also might be problem solving. But now, how many genres? Do we have like a magical number of genres? This question for, for um, the genre experts is not an answerable question. And Swales gives an interesting example of a three-minute presentation, like the context now we are in. Think of it as two components, actually, or two independent genres, if you may say. We have a 20-minute uh, talk that's already led by the speaker, and then you have the interactions in the last 10 minutes. Are these two different genres, or these, or these are just one? If you are a lumper, which means you are from biology, you believe that different species, different species are still under the same, the same category or the same species, you might consider these two components as one genre because it is the same speaker and it is the same purpose and it is the same topic. But if you are a splitter, which is still also from biology, you consider these as two different types of genres because you have different stylistic features in each one. One of them is led by the speaker, the other component, there is an interaction between the speaker and between the audience. Uh, now, let's get into the pedagogical aspect of this. That's like the theoretical background. This framework um, in, uh, in rhetoric and composition studies made its way into applied linguistics. And it was adopted mainly in English as a second language and English as a foreign language. Uh, we know from all these uh, previous studies that the genre-based approach uh, has made great improvements in teaching English as a second or foreign language. And those who um, work on, on the development of writing or the components of the writing process, they focus on the organizational improvement when you go and uh, structure your letter or your essay in a way that seems very professional. They also talk about the development of linguistic structures. They talk about lexical features, like the use of collocations. Are the students able to use many of these collocations that are register specific, that are used specifically in these types of texts? But what about, what about Arabic? Now, let's see, this framework that has been used uh, has been very fruitful in English. But what about Arabic? When you, I went over the body of literature in, uh, in teaching Arabic or teaching writing in Arabic as a foreign language, you mainly will find these two, uh, these two studies, basically. The first is by Shaker and Obeidet, and basically it examined the deficiencies in, in writings by students. The second is uh, Khaldeya, it talked about what makes a text cohesive versus non-cohesive. But the use of the genre-based the, the genre framework is not utilized in Arabic as a foreign language. What about textbooks? Uh, are these integrated in Arabic? The answer is yes, too many of them. And I did a content analysis for the first part in Al-Kitab. It's interesting that we have at least 16 genres in Al-Kitab part one. These include poem, job advertisements, uh, news articles, narrations. We have many of these. But the, the, the problem with these genres in Al-Kitab part one, these are presented as reading comprehension. So just the students are exposed to these to know the meanings of what the text or the meaning of what the text says, and then we check their comprehension. There is no one more step, which is the actual purpose of integrating the genre for developing the writing skills. Uh, now, which genre am I, uh, am I proposing? Uh, I'm going now to show um, two uh, texts, and these are two letters, uh, as I just said. Uh, the reason I decided to focus on congratulation letters because they are very common in Arabic and they are basic communicative needs. So if you are in first year Arabic or second year Arabic, you need to send something to your uh, classmate or your friend overseas. You need, you need to learn how to do this in Arabic. Uh, second, uh, when I just went online about uh, feedback from students, uh, how they approach uh, writing letters in Arabic, has it covered and not, uh, not been covered, what they believe. And I found a forum here that was very uh, uh, insightful. Uh, we had a student here from the US, uh, he is saying, hello all, uh, I, want to, um, I want to springboard off of a recent post to pose a new question. One of the unfortunate gaps in my Arabic education over the years was that I never learned how to write proper Arabic letters. 
That's correspondence, not the script. When I did have to correspond by letter, it was invariably in English due to academic or political nature of our relationship. And in any case, letter correspondence was just infrequent since the phone or informal email was easier. But I'm going to talk about this. The fact that we have the email now, it does not mean that uh, the convention of letters or congratulation letters have been removed or it changed. You still keep the conventions of these different types of genres, but still you follow at the same time or you keep the conventions of an email. But the structure of a letter is still there within the email. Are there certain conventions in writing Arabic letters, either personal or formal, as in French? Are these their websites that point out these conventions? So this was part of, uh, of my motivation for focusing on letters specifically. Uh, when I did the content analysis for first part of Al-Kitab, only 3.7 of the total number of genres uh, uh, was actually uh, in letters. So only 3.7. The rest are different types of genres. And again, as reading comprehension tasks. Now let's go over um, uh, the two reading, the two texts that I just um, talked about. Uh, the first uh, written um, by a friend um, in Kuwait uh, to his classmate. Is, uh, his name is Said, and he says, Azizi Said. Then he started by uh, where he is, Al Kuwait. في العاشر من سبتمبر 2008. It's in Kuwait, September 10. But in Arabic, we start by the conventionally we start by the day first and then the month, not like here and then 2008. عزيزي سعيد, dear سعيد, تحية طيبة مفعمة بالحب والإخلاص. It's like greetings. That's a full of love and sincerity. يطيب لي أن أبعث لكم هذه الرسالة لأقدم لكم أجمل تحياتي وتهانية الخالصة الممزوجة بالفرح والسعادة. بمناسبة نجاحكم الباهر في الامتحان الجامعي الأخير. Within the same paragraph, he keeps going and saying, لم يكن يشوبني أدنى شك في حصولكم على هذه النتيجة السارة، لقد شمرتم عن ساعد الجد والاجتهاد خلال سنوات دراستكم. أتمنى لكم حظا سعيدا في الحصول على وظيفة مناسبة في المستقبل القريب. And then another paragraph starts وختاما. أسأل الله أن يحفظكم ويرعاكم ويعطيكم الصحة والعافية أخوكم حليم. This is the informal one sent by a student to his classmate. But let's contrast this to a formal one. And the formal one is taken from جريدة الرياض in Saudi Arabia. It's written by one of the journalists. to another journalist who is the editor of Sahifat uh, al-Riyadh because he was selected to represent the, the Saudi uh, journalists in the journalist syndicate. He said, Sa'adat al-Ustad Turki bin Abdullah al-Sudairi. So it seems like the way he started was very completely different. He started by an honorific term here or address form Sa'adat al-Ustad, not as easy. And then there was three points and then Sallamahullah. It seems like Sallamahullah is highly specific to the Saudi culture. And then his title, Ra'is Tahrir Sahifat al-Riyad wa Ra'is Majlit Adarit Hayat al-Sahafiyin al-Saudiyin. And then space, Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. And then three dots, wa ba'd. Yusaiduni an asji lakum akhlas al-tahani bimunasabat fawzikum al-mustahaq Ra'isan li majlisi adarit Hayat al-Sahafiyin al-Saudiyin. Wa ma hustum alayh min thiqatin kabira من أوساط الصحفيين وهو ما يحمل الدلالة العميقة على ما تتمتعون به من رصيد ضخم في ميدان العمل الصحفي وتقدير لإسهامكم البارز كأحد فرسان الكلمة وتطوير الممارسة الصحفية وحرية التعبير في بلادنا الغالية And then one more paragraph starts ولعل هذا النجاح الباهر الذي تجلى في التجربة الثانية لانتخابات الصحفيين السعوديين وممارسة حرية التعبير داخل الوسط الصحفي في المملكة وعلى هذا النحو الذي شاهدناه من رقي في السلوك ما تمخض عنه من نجاح للانتخابات ليعطي أبلغ الدروس على أن القاعدة الصحفية السعودية مدركة لمسؤولياتها ومستوعبة لأرقى قيم التعبير ويؤكد أننا سائرون على درب التطور الحضاري بكل ثقة وثبات 
نكست وان مور موف اننا نتطلع الى نجاحكم في قياده الهيئه بما يرتقي بمستوى العمل المهني والصحفي في بلادنا وتشجيع الطاقات الخلاقه لدى الصحفيين والمفكرين ويعطي المثل والقدوه في شكل ممارسه حريه التعبير وهو ما سيكون رصيدا جديدا يضاف لرصيد عطائكم في ميدان العمل الصحفي and then there is a, uh, an end والله يوفقكم لما فيه مصلحة الصحفيين والوطن الغالي and then محبكم and then his title and then his name when we get into a basic genre analysis of these two ones we watch a number of different moves in each one with the informal one the personal one started by date of writing and then the first move which is greeting the addressee using Azizi and then the second move which is opening greeting and then the third move was the main body the purpose or the content and then the fourth was was a detail of what what already he said Let's see You might refer to this as expansion. And then there was wishing, and this wishing is personal, and then there was end the greeting. But the structure of the impersonal one is very different. It started by the name, and then the date, and then within the Saudi culture, you have, it seems like you have to add the two calendars within the same date. And then there was the address's name and his title. Here there is some variation. Some people start by start by name and then title. Some other people start by title first and then name. Uh, I have seen both in, in, uh, in the analysis. Then there was the main body, purpose or content. But the main, the main uh, body, purpose or content here is very elaborate. He gives more details about what happened. And then this was the justification or expansion is also very elaborate. But then here we find two different types of wishing. The first is context bound, which is highly relevant to the context that he is talking about. And this is followed by another wishing, which is context free. So one of them, he keeps following up about what he wishes him to be doing after he got this position. And then there was an open one. Then there was the ending, and then there was the signature. Uh, now, do we consider these as two independent genres or as one genre? If you are a splitter, these are two independent ones because the stylistic features in both seems to be different. Address forms and honorifics are different. The moves, there are also some changes in these. But if you are a lumber, you might consider these as the same because the task is still the same, which is to congratulate the person on something good that he did. Now, if you have these two texts and you want to bring them to the class, and that's the real work of the teacher now, uh, what should be a good way of presenting these? Uh, a good way of presenting these is to select a number of texts that represent the same genre, and then try to use the splitter's approach. Why the splitter and not the lumper? Because we want our students in the Arabic classes to be able to come up or create or develop similar texts that have these structural features. One way to do this is to use what we know as corpora. That's a, a number of texts that have been retrieved from the internet using some sort of software. But actually in Arabic we don't have many of these. Uh, the alternate is to go to Google or Google Scholar and try to select a number of texts that have these features and then you try to zoom in to see the stylistic features. You may start by having a number of questions for your students. One of them, following up with the same texts, you might ask, laying out the purpose in the formal letter, what are the common nouns that precede uh, the word attehani here? So when we have the word attehani in over all of these, what are the words that preceded them? Let's have a look at we, at we just read, or uh, 
One of them was uh, what I already presented, and these are different ones from Google Scholar. Akhlas uh, al was one. Sadiq al was a, uh, one. Ahar al Tahani. Arqa wa Asma al Tahani. Asma Ayat al Tahani. And then Khalas al Tahani. A next question may be to ask about the pattern of these lexical words that were used before at Tahani. It seems like most of them, if not all of them, are al wazn al rabi wazn al the superlative four. Uh, also, you may ask, which one is more common? After you get these ten texts, which one is more common? Yatibu li am yusaiduni an am yasuruni an. Because all these uh, were used at the beginning of these letters. And then the students will go over these. It seems like we have all of them. But Yatibu Li, Yasuruni is very common. So we have Yatibu Li and Arfa Ilaykum Sadiq al Tahani. Yes, Yusaiduni an, Yasuruni an, and then Yusaiduna an, and then Yatibu Li an, Yusaiduni and Yusaiduni. It seems like Yusaiduni is more common. One more question here, is he using I or using we in the formal register or in the formal genre? Because in Arabic, as we know, if it's an official letter, there is a possibility to use we are pleased that instead of I am pleased that. So students should know here which one is more common now, using we or using I. One more is to know which verb actually collocates with the word at tahani when we have a verb and then a noun. Seems like we have variations here. We have arfa ilaykum asdaq at tahani that was very frequent. And then ataqaddamu bi at tahani and then uqaddimu lakum at tahani Students should detect, should discover which one of these three different ways was common. Also, he might ask the students to distinguish between the use of ataqaddam and then nataqaddam, it's I versus we again, and the differences between ataqaddam and uqaddam within the context of the greetings. Also, the differences between these honorifics or address forms in Arabic, as Sayyid, Sa'adit, Ma'ali, Sahib al Sumo. They, all these are used in these formal letters. But the social distance between the writer and the addressee is a key factor in determining which one you have to use. Now, is it possible to develop a short lesson plan to present these two texts into the class, given all these stylistic features? Let's see. A very basic framework is uh, the California framework for teaching foreign languages. And it says, basically, when you develop your lesson plan, you start by the objectives, and then you present the input, which is the no language. And then you present the guided practice. And then you get into the free practice and then the assessment. Now, is it possible to make use of these two texts, the formal and the informal ones, and try to teach our students the stylistic features that I just presented? You may develop your objectives in the following way. Culture, we want to know what's appropriate in Arabic and what is not appropriate in Arabic. Because if you are writing to a friend, it's different from if you are writing to your, uh, to your boss or writing to uh, an editor or writing to uh, a director of a company. The students should know these variations. But the language objectives is to identify, moving from the big to the small, they should identify the rhetorical moves in these ones, and also the stylistic features that distinguish the informal from the formal. And here I am highlighting two keywords to deconstruct first. They have to know how to deconstruct these texts and then how to construct them again. Um, it seems logical to start with the deconstruction first and then you take them into the construction step. Uh, what about the linguistic input? What should we be doing to get them into the, de the, 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 the deconstruction and then the construction? One way is to just get, select two texts from the internet that are uh, original, that are uh, authentic, and then you give them a sheet like this. You ask them to write in Arabic about the purpose of the text, or the writer of the text, the intended audience, the relationship or the social distance, and then the key moves, and then the honorifics and titles, and then they just write these. The next step, if you are in, a, in an advanced class, they have to contrast between the informal and the formal one. 
you give them more or less the same chart, but you give them two letters. One of them is formal, the other one is informal, and then they have to sketch out or lay out these different features for the formal one and the informal one. Guided practice, uh, I am proposing here like three basic activities. We use them in Arabic classes for different purposes. One of them is uh, textual organizations. Uh, and for textual organization, the way this may be done is you just get, you, you get um, uh, one letter and then you cut it into pieces, like the first move, the greeting, the closing, and then you ask the students to come up with the right sequence. So they just go and see, oh, it seems like this is the logical sequence of this letter. The second is to color code, to color code these labels or these rhetorical moves, and then ask the students to match them. So you'll see this is like the this is like wishing that's context bound, and this is wishing that's context free. Once they do this, you may also do the information gap or the jexo, and those um, uh, who come from um, an applied linguistics background they know the differences between these. It's basically you have five groups in, in, within the class, and each group has one component of the task, and we want to see if they are able to come up with the big picture. So one group will have like two moves, another will have like one more move, and the third will have like three more moves. And then they come up uh, together to see, oh, it seems like this is the sequence. I have this and you have that, and then we match them up. And as I just said here, it's a good idea to start by in-group, in, in the meaning that you have like three students in one group, they come up with the moves within one part, and then you have the between group. So you start in and then you get into the between. Text creation, um, it's uh, easy to give them a prompt like this in English and not in Arabic. And here in our program, we, we just give them the prompt in English because it makes their task harder, not easier. Because they have to translate the prompt in English and then translate the structure in their heads and then they come up with the language. So we use English uh, for giving instructions. You may give them uh, guidelines like these. You give them the purpose of the text, it's congratulations. You give them the writer, the audience, the relationship, and then the key moves, you just give them like the basics, and then you ask them to integrate at least three to five out of these. Uh, in the assessment part, uh, you give them like a prompt without the specific guidelines, and then they have to integrate these guidelines from the previous step in the assessment component. With this, you have to use something that's relevant to the real life, Common ones, maybe your friend Sami in Beirut, Lebanon, has recently got a new job in Google Lebanon. Write a letter to congratulate him on the new job and wish him great success. Here you just give him the task and you just left the students to come up with the rhetorical sequence that we just talked about. Uh, it's possible at the advanced levels to ask them to come up with a formal one, an informal one, and then they draw the comparison. What about a rubric for assessing their work? Uh, here I have just um, five, four basic components. We have the overall structure, if the structure has been kept in mind. Second is intelligibility, does it mean something to me as an Arabic reader? And the accuracy, here you just focus on the lexical grammatical features, the address forms, the collocations, noun adjectives, and then appropriateness. Is it appropriate in terms of the target culture or not? Uh, I'm just concluding with um, uh, four basic guidelines for integrating this approach in Arabic. The first is the early integration. The fact that our students at the first year have limited linguistic capacities does not mean that we should not integrate the genre-based approach. Because it is possible to get very basic genres, simple ones, and then you begin to teach them the rhetorical moves when you, mo when you go from one part to another. The second is to try to select as authentic texts as you can. And when you just go type in Google a letter, you will find hundreds of these from different parts in the Arab world. The third is to uh, teach them explicitly and not implicitly the structure of genre. So you have to teach them here the movement or the moves that uh, are followed by native speakers in formal letters should run in the following way. And last, we may think of developing pedagogical treatments, and I'm here suggesting two ones. The first is for us who are just teaching on a daily basis. We might integrate the genre-based approach as a research, as an action research. An action research is basically you take that module and you try to teach it over like two weeks or three weeks to get it done. 
even if the textbook does not integrate the genre-based approach. The second is the systematic one that's done by researchers, like uh, the, the long tradition uh, in English as a second uh, or foreign language. And that's the end of my talk. <laughs>